Welcome to another episode of Meaningful Live. What does the Bible say about DEI? Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. This program is dedicated by Penny and Jean Friedberg in memory of S. Pearson Orbach, M MD. I just read an article literally just a short while ago, the Wall Street Journal about University of Florida closing down their entire DEI department and all their staff. Clearly, there's much controversy, especially recently around DEI. And uh, many accuse, of it, accuse it of being anti-Semitic, of, uh, of having double standards, of officially trying to express diversity, equity, and inclusion for all minorities, except minorities that uh, some of these activists do not like. At the same time, you cannot deny the fact, the idea of creating the ability that nobody be discriminated against, including minorities, is extremely noble. So how do we make heads or tails of this? You know, the positive sides of it, how can it be abused, how it's being weaponized by some. I mean, we all remember when Mr. Floyd was killed in uh, Minnesota, how that, in a way, many saw that as reviving or creating a whole new, a whole new wave of support for DEI, one person. And yet, when 1,200 people were brutally massacred, including women raped and so on, you don't see the same amount of outcry. So some justified because Jews are no longer a minority, they're not oppressed. I mean, there's all kinds of explanations. When we saw the university presidents squirming in their seats during the Senate, or the, uh, when it was the Senate hearings about anti-Semitism, and they were asked questions about whether the call for the annihilation of the Jewish people is considered to be breaking policy of universities, and the response was that it matters context. I mean, everyone immediately saw the bankruptcy and the hypocrisy of that. So there's a lot to be said about this. How do you make heads or tails of clarity? How do you achieve clarity? So I want to put it into a context, a biblical context, if I may. From the beginning of time, the challenge always existed of how do we, in a world of diversity, of people with different opinions, and majorities and minorities, and the people in power wanting to often oppress and subjugate those in less power. How do you create an equality in, in, in situations like that? The fact of the matter, history is a very sad commentary, sad is a mild word, of the discrimination of majorities against minorities, of those in power against those that are less in power, of the oppressed, by the oppressors and the oppressed. It's the history. It's only the last few last centuries especially with the founding of the United States, with the concept of institutionalized freedom, the idea that all men are created equal, and I would use all people are created equal, became something that is institutionalized. It didn't exist before that. The only place you found the concept was in the Bible. All human beings are created in the divine image, regardless of color, race, religion, creed, whether you're majority or minority. Nowhere does it say the majority are created in the divine image and the minority are not. But throughout history, monarchs ruled. The church ruled for many centuries. You had others, despots, fascists, totalitarians. Sometimes you had benevolent ones, but very often not. We were at the mercy of whatever their opinions were. The kings were considered closer to God than everyone else. And they behaved that way. And they accumulated the wealth and they subjugated and enslaved those, those that, were, uh, that, that, that were under their control. As, as the Jewish people, I mean, we should be looked at as the first that suffered. The first documented institutionalized slavery was the Jewish people under the hands of the Egyptians. And for centuries, the exodus from Egypt becomes the classic watershed moment that everybody looks at as being... Everyone tried to emulate that exodus. So what does the Bible say about this? So the very concept that we are all different 
and at the same time all created equally because we're all created in the divine image is fundamental, essential, not just a footnote. It's the first and most important statement in the entire Bible. Because without that, everything else falls. All laws between human beings of coexistence and so on, all are based on that. And that's how the Bible begins. After the creation, six days of the entire world, then comes the creation of the human being. And God said, I shall create them in my image. Male and female, he created them, God did. And that's it, that's the statement, that the human being is created in the divine image. All human beings come from Adam and Eve. That's the basis of everything. So no one has to preach to anyone that reads the Bible about diversity, equity, and inclusion, a DEI. It's essentially, that's where it comes from. And I'm going to make the argument that without that, you'll have distorted versions of it because you can then abuse the very statement that we are going to now equal the, the scales and give people who have been oppressed or people who are minorities equal opportunity, can that itself can be weaponized and used in ways that are reverse discrimination. And the word, the key word is that divine image. I always wondered, why is it that in the Declaration of Independence, with the Constitution of the United States clearly delineating a separation of church and state, why would they use the statement, which in intentionally is a controversial one? The word creator used at least twice. All men are created equal and are endowed by the creator with inalienable rights. These are the truths we find self-evident. Why use the word creator? You could have used the word all men are born equal. All people are equal. Why created equal? And the, endowed by the creator. I've asked many legal scholars, constitutional scholars. I've never found an adequate answer. I have my theory, which I'll share with you, but with a little introduction. It's based on insurance policy of all places. So you look at insurance policies that cover, let's say, property damage. So we'll talk about the different damages it covers. Then we'll talk about hurricanes, earthquakes, other disasters, and acts of God. Interesting word. Suddenly God appears could say acts of nature. And here I did check and said, why does it say acts of God? So one attorney told me, because it's simple. If you wrote acts of nature, it still leaves open that if a hurricane happens, someone can say, well, you should be responsible, the insurance company, for an act of nature, like a hurricane or an earthquake or a volcano. Once you say it's acts of God, it's God's domain. It's clearly not our responsibility. Well, suddenly, when it comes to protecting interest, suddenly God is invoked. The perfect scapegoat. So my thought is this. The founding fathers in their wisdom, and not religious, not advocating religion, was not advocating religion, because it's freedom of religion, that the, that the United States shall not pass a law that supports any religion, and so on, or against the religion. They understood in their wisdom that the only way you can guarantee absolutely that people will be equal is not when we give them equality, because you can also take back equality. And you could also define what does equality mean? It's knowing that God, that we are created equal, and it's God that endows, the creator that endows us with these inalienable rights. Take away God, it's all arbitrary. I actually use this in an interesting context. Let me share with you the context. You may remember it was in 1995. 1995 was I remember the, the, the secular date. I know it was the day before Yom Kippur, 1995, which would be, um, yeah, it's almost, to, almost 30 years ago. And I, my book was just published then, Toward a Meaningful Life. So the publicist at William Morrow lined up many interviews for me. And uh, one of them was a major uh, radio station down south that covered a few major states. And I was scheduled for an hour interview, talk about my book, Toward a Meaningful Life. Great. So very, it was considered a prestigious, prestigious, prestigious interview. That morning, I get a phone call. News broke. That morning is when the O.J. Simpson verdict was delivered and he was acquitted. The glove don't fit. You got to acquit. Remember that jingle? So the producer of the show called me and said, 
everyone's only talking about O.J. Simpson now. And your book is going to just, if we talk about your book, it's just not what's on people's minds. So let's reschedule for another time. I don't know, for some reason, my instinct was, I said, oh, we have this opportunity, let's talk about it. I'll talk about O.J. Simpson verdict. You have what to say about it? Does your book have something? I said, yes. Between us, I had no idea what I was going to say, but I just thought, I'm in the door, I might as well stay. So, so fine, why do you have to go find another, another person to interview? They already had me lined up. I remember 11 a.m., I was, my interview began. And right away, talk about the breaking news, O.J. Simpson. And what do I have to say about it? So I'll share with you the whole, uh, the whole context. So I said, I just want to make this point. As we're talking in this interview, I want to tell you that there are many Jews right now preparing for the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. And they don't even know about the O.J. Simpson verdict. Not to dismiss it, but I just want to tell you. And I shared with them, I said, in other words, there are things, some things that are, transcend the here and now and the moment, the news, the new breaking news. And I shared with them that Levi Yitzhak Baditchev once stood leading a prayer, I think it was Yom Kippur, and he said, as he was leading, he was the cantor that led the, the prayer, the chazan, and he said, the Russians say that their czar is the greatest. The Prussians say that their emperor is the greatest. The British say that their king is the greatest. And I, Levi Yitzhak, when Sarah Shasha say, Yiskadov, Yiskadov, Shmei Rabba. May your name be glorified and sanctified and hallowed. So I, I said, I wanted to just put things into context. As far as, and the, as, far as the, very, the verdict itself, it will never be resolved. You see what was going on. The blacks were celebrating. The whites were cursing. Everybody got into their corners. The polarization just demonstrated the racial tensions in this country. Everyone knew that he was guilty. But you know what? They got, they, they got him acquitted on a technicality. The glove don't fit. You got to acquit. And it just brought out all the ugly ugly um, racist attitudes, both black to white and white to black, etc., etc. So I said, the only solution to the O.J. Simpson, what OJ, the O.J. Simpson verdict revealed, is a story in my book. And I opened up to the chapter, the chapter, I believe it's on unity. And I, and I read a story that after the riots in 1991, the summer of 1991 in Crown Heights, so we know there was the pogrom, literally. I was there that summer, and Jews were being attacked, and Jewish stores were being broken into, and vandalism and all that. Officially, this was allowing the blacks to vent after an accidental accident, a tragic accident of Gavin Cato was killed by a, a Jewish driver in an entourage. And they went, and they actually killed in cold blood then Yankel Rosenbaum. Later we found out that Mayor Dinkins and the police all said to stand down and let them vent, let the blacks vent. And later it was discovered most of the blacks that were the, the, that were the agitators were not even from the community. It was a big, big mess at the time. Mayor Dinkins was by the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe, for dollars. And he said to the Rebbe, he's asking for a blessing for unity among the two peoples, the two races, the blacks and the Jews. And the Rebbe responded to him, it's not two people, it's one people under one God. And I said, that's the solution. Because you can do all kinds of regulations, and you could have um, the, 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 the DE, DEI, and you can have all types of um, laws passed. But the fundamental discrimination, whether it's men to women, or it's whites to blacks, or majorities to minorities, whatever shape, form, and whatever color, race, religion, and so on, will never be resolved unless you invoke that we are all children of God, and we're all equal children. Equal does not mean we're clones. It means we are diverse. But it's understanding that, that's what gives the right to protect every person's individual rights. And if you take God out of the picture, then any minority can say, you know what, we've been oppressed. You Jews are no longer being oppressed. You decided that. Well, the Jews are not being oppressed just because some of them are successful, just because we're a successful minority. So who decides exactly which minority is going to be protected? And once you start doing that, and humans decide, it, become weaponized, it becomes weaponized, politicized, and even commercialized. And that's where you find the major distortions and abuse. So the very concept 
that every human being should be given an equal opportunity? Absolutely. But as even the, even the justices and the justice, the black justice in the Supreme Court, he's the one that's so against certain, certain laws because he says it's actually empowering people to remain in a place where they're not excelling at their own terms, their own merits. And that is also a problem. So you want to give people the opportunity, but you want them also to earn their right. Not just because you're a minority or because you've been oppressed, we're going to bend over backwards to not allow you to necessarily excel. We'll just make it easier for you. Never discriminate, but make everybody work hard. We'll give you the opportunity. And what's happening with the abuse of it is, financially and other ways, and we start getting into the fundraising of it, it becomes a cause that is representing necess not necessarily equality altogether. It's representing certain agendas of minorities, and it could be severely abused. And many are recognizing that. So how do you counter that? That doesn't mean that the majority should always be... In it means that we need to have a criteria. And the criteria is, yes, that we were all created in the divine image, despite color or creed or minority or majority. And that's what guarantees that. And now we have to pass laws that make sure that everybody is treated as a divine child, as a divine image, and given those opportunities. Just to make a quota in order to have enough blacks or enough Hispanics or Asians or others that people determine are oppressed to be given the opportunities and have a quota of not allowing whites or others in, that's not enough to reason. You have to give them equal opportunity and not let anyone be excluded but maybe is there anything for merit? One student is better than another, despite a white student happens to be excelling in what they're doing? Yes, can that be abused? Of course it, was, it can be abused and was abused. But what protects it, that's what the founding fathers, who by no means were trying to introduce anything religious, were saying that all men are created equal and are endowed by the Creator with, with, uh, with, by, with these rights that we consider self-evident, the freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And yes, the freedom of the ability equally to get education and business opportunities and no discrimination based on race or any other detail. But at the same time, equality. It's not just, oh, we're going to compensate for someone. When God forbid you have children, one family of children, and one child is weaker than another. Let's say a child is handicapped, special child. You're not going to make believe that that child is, going to, is, is equal to another child that has the aptitude or has abilities that that child doesn't have. You're not going to discriminate. You still love your child. And yes, you'll do things to compensate and you'll do things to support that child. But to create the illusion that that child who, let's say, cannot, cannot manage a company. But we're going to make believe you could manage a company. No, but you're not capable of managing a company. That's not discrimination. It's recognizing. It's actually... Actually, the opposite. It's abusing someone, trying to force them to be something they're not, just in order to satisfy a quota to show, you know, we're treating that person equally because you see they've risen to a position. If they want to rise to the position, they have to earn that way. You don't want to impede that because everyone should have that equal opportunity. So we need a real market correction and reality check for the whole DEI movement to clean it out, to make sure it's not being abused to make sure it's not being, uh, mon uh, being politicized or weaponized. To be, uh, and one of the ways is a very good way when you see that you decide, you've decided which, uh, who are the oppressed and who are the oppressors. You've decided which minority you're going to represent and which not. You know? And just because it's, uh, the, the Jewish people are successful, that doesn't make them not targets. We've had anti-Semitic attacks and we continue to have. And if you want to be credible, you should get up and, sp and speak out on behalf of anyone that's oppressed. Even if, it's a, if a white person is bullied in a classroom, it's equally deplorable, just as if it's a black person or a Jew or a, some, or a Hispanic or an Asian or another minority in that part of the world. You know, I recently was speaking to an attorney who I know he's been coming to my classes. He's a big activist for the, for, um, the, for the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter. And we were talking and he said to me, you know, um, why don't you come out doing a march? He's like a, he works for that that for for, the, for them, for that group. He says, "Why don't you come out and um, march with me?" So 
I said to him, let me ask you something. And we were friends. I said to him, I, I, I admire and I commend you for representing a cause. But I have to understand something. Besides the fact that you're Jewish, that, even if you're not, it doesn't make a difference. I didn't see you marching with the Tree of Life um, with the synagogue when there was the shooting in Pittsburgh or other minorities. Why are you, you, you you're choosing, selecting very selectively which minorities you march with? If I saw you marching with all minorities, then it was one thing. You're inviting me only the ones that you decided that are important. He did not like what I said. He says, you sound like a racist. I said, I sound like a racist. And anyway, I didn't want to argue with him. He does respect me, but I didn't. I just wanted to point it out. And I saw right there. He decided what he thinks says the minorities. I have no problem with defend all the minorities. But why is it selective? And once it's selective, you, you can't, can you trust it? Maybe you have other agendas. Maybe you're being paid. Maybe you have other, you know, what, what, what is going on? And that is the problem. That's a major problem. All human beings are created in the divine image, and therefore all lives matter. And I know that's not politically correct, because when you say all lives matter, oh, that means black lives don't really matter. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying they absolutely matter. They matter like everybody else matters. Why is that a problem to say that? If someone has a history of discriminating against blacks, I understand they may try to couch, they're trying to uh, dilute it. It means that all human beings were created in the divine image, and I stand by that and I'm ready to march with any one of them, only if it's not political and it's not being used for other agendas. To go march with someone who's marching because of a minority and then I hear from them anti-Semitic slurs, they lose all the credibility. You're not, you're, you're here to, to present your own agenda. You're not here to present the human race. You're definitely not here to present God's children. And I say it very bluntly and I hope this is taken the right way. And I think that's the attitude that we should take when it comes to something like DEI. So by all means, the positive parts of it, let's embrace. But let's clean it out from politics and where it's being misused. And you can tell pretty much when you start seeing being used very selectively. So the end of the day is this. Every human being, and I hope everyone listening to this recognizes, we, you are created in the divine image. And as such, you are indispensable to God's plan. You have a role to play that you and only you can fulfill. Literally, you. And you must play that role. And therefore, I am ready to fight whatever it takes for you to do that. At the same time, we all complement each other because we all need each other in this grand symphony, grand cosmic and divine symphony. So let's really turn it into a true understanding of harmony within diversity, understanding the differences between people, and, then not, and just to make, to make someone who is not a carpenter into a carpenter does not give them equality. You're actually torturing them. Let them be who they should be with their skills and with their resources. Give them all the opportunities. Educate them. Do not discriminate on the basis of anything. But let them be themselves. Let them grow into what they should become. And let everyone do that. Don't force anyone through quotas or other ways. That's the way to ultimately create the ultimate respect for both the diversity and the harmony and unity between all of us. Thank you so much. Simon Jacobson of Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. If you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear from you. Please share this with others. Please subscribe to our growing, uh, robust YouTube channel and our other offerings. And uh, all your feedback is very welcome because you are created in the divine image. Be well. Thank you.